to be here in the Ōtaki and Mana electorates as we enter the fourth to last day of this year's election campaign. Um, it's great to see the momentum and the positivity of the Labour teams on the ground here who are getting out there and making it happen for Labour. Also great to run into a lot of people who have been out there and voted already uh, and given their two ticks to Labour. So uh, I want to uh, say thank you to them for that. Uh, as we enter this final stretch of the campaign, I think it's becoming very clear to New Zealanders that if Christopher Luxon and the National Party win, they are going to lose. Uh, because while very few New Zealanders, less than 1%, will benefit from the tax cuts that they have promised and the, and the quantum that they have been promising, it's clear that everybody will pay. Uh, I'll give you three examples of why their numbers don't add up. First of all, less than 1% of New Zealanders would get the $250 a fortnight that the National Party have been repeatedly promising on the campaign trail. That is now very clear, and even they have admitted that. Uh, the second thing is that our families or you know, those who are on benefits could be $2,000 a year worse off, uh, with thousands more children in poverty because of the benefit cuts that National are signalling. And then when we flip that, we see, and this is the third reason, $6,000 a year in tax breaks for landlords. I think that shows the National Party have their priorities all wrong. In a cost of living crisis, they want to take money away from our poorest families and have thousands more children living in poverty so that they can give tax breaks to landlords. I just think that is wrong. I think the National Party have got their priorities wrong. Um, I think that New Zealanders are certainly coming to the realisation that if National wins, they are going to lose. Because whilst very few New Zealanders will benefit from the tax cuts that they have been promised, every New Zealander will pay the price of them. Can you talk us through the by-election announcement you've just made? Mm. So um, the, I consulted with the other parties. I think everybody was in agreement that the earliest date possible the best uh, would be best. Uh, the official advice that I received was that the earliest the Electoral Commission believe they can do it is Saturday the 25th of November. Um, and so I've approved, that, approved it on that basis. It's a bit of a weird law that a candidate who didn't really have much chance of winning that seat dies during the run-up to the voting day and then we have to have a whole by-election. It is a bit of a sort of, a, 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 um, I guess, a, a technicality. However, having said that, if it had been one of the main candidates, for example, it could have had a material impact. So, um, and the Electoral Commission aren't are in a position to form judgments on who was likely to be elected or not to be elected. So the process has to be fair. Um, it's something that I think as we review the electoral law after the election, which we always do, and we can look at whether there's a fairer way of dealing with Will that. Be a big boost for national, do you think? <clears throat> well, I've been having this argument with people this morning um, because I think it's clear that a lot of people don't understand the way the MMP formula operates. So we will have an additional list MP in the next parliament. Um, so that is, so whoever gets that additional list seat are the ones who are most likely to benefit from this. And we won't know that until all the votes have been counted, including all the special votes, because the way the formula for allocating out list MPs um, flows, it just really depends on who's the last, who would be the last MP in. So this doesn't, this doesn't guarantee national an extra, extra list seat? Um, not necessarily. Because um, Andrew Bailey, he's number 16 on the list, which means he's pretty much guaranteed to get in. If the election came down to a one-seat margin once all of the votes were counted and the, all of the, all the 120 seats had been allocated, then that 121st seat would make a difference. Yes, yeah, so, so essentially you need every seat you can get, though, so this makes it hard for you. Well, it could actually give us an extra seat, depending on who the last party is to get a list member. Do you feel for those Port Waikato voters having to do this all over again pretty soon? I think no-one relishes the idea of a by-election uh, immediately after the election, and in fact, it'll start before the election is even finished. Do you have a um, I think we just need to look at the options for how best to deal with a situation where a candidate passes away after nomination day but before polling closes. Will Labour stand a candidate? I haven't made that decision yet. So what date have you chosen? Uh, so it is the 25th of November, Saturday the 25th. That's the advice that we've had um, from the Electoral Commission is that's the earliest possible date they could do it. I think everyone would like to have it sooner if there was a way of doing it sooner because the people in Port Waikato have just had an election campaign, so I think they've had the opportunity to think about who they might want to represent them. Um, but unfortunately, they can't do it any faster than that. How do we settle on that date? Uh, the Electoral Commission provided a range of options. I indicated that I wanted the earliest available option. Uh, we then consulted with the other parties. The other parties asked, particularly the National Party asked, could it be even sooner than that? Uh, we went back to the Electoral Commission and they said no. So it, that's pretty much where it's landed. What, what, was, what was the other option that's on the table? Uh, the following weekend. The $6,000 um, figure for the average 
landlord, right? Is that, that, that what you, that's what he says about six thousand dollars. That's right. Landlord. How do you how do you get that? Well, well the man who's the man who's involved <laughs> in those figures is with me. Now I have to say he has to leave at about ten past. So if you've got questions on uh, costings and finances. Make the most of the opportunity now. <laughs> Thanks. Well, Thomas, it's essentially done by going through the data that we has been publicly made available around interest deductibility and what that was worth, and then dividing it up by the number of landlords. Now, right. clearly, if you've got many properties, it'll start to change, but I think it's a relatively conservative estimate. And what I'd say, and I said it last night in the debate as well, and Chris has just said it now, it's really, you know, we could have to fight about the exact number, but the reality is... That is being prioritised by the National Party ahead of children in some of the lowest income households in New Zealand. It's a question of values, it's a question of priorities, and they've got them wrong. Oh, so you take about, I forget what it is, about 500, 600 million divided by the number of landlords in that case. Yeah, essentially, get it. Is there a $736 million hole in your budget? Of course not. And um, it's interesting, isn't it, that the National Party quickly uh, put this together after we uh, essentially just went to a range of external commentators' views. So that's what we've done. You all know, all of you know, nobody believes that National's tax promise actually adds up. We put that together. They've now made a few of their own assumptions. They're wrong, for example, about the GST of uh, fruit and vegetables. That's simply incorrect. They're double counting there. Uh, when it comes to uh, what we've done with the dental uh, care work, we've taken the Ministry of Health's costings there and used that um, rather than some extrapolation of the household expenditure survey. So we're very confident in our numbers. Their numbers have been proven by economists from left, right and centre to be wrong. You've, you've um, always said that it's free dental care for under 30s and then you'll expand it out to everyone else. Today you're kind of saying, no, it's free basic dental care. Oh, that was very clear on the day. In fact, I remember standing in a stand-up just like this uh, where we, um, Aisha Vera went through what was covered under free basic dental care. So that's been out there but from day hands, one. But say free dental care and you're celebrating it. So yep, and we've been very clear that that's free basic dental care. But, but it doesn't say the word basic. It? This is like the too, but for you guys. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't accept that at all. Has um, campaign chair Chris Bishop been put in the freezer? We haven't seen him on the campaign trail for... Oh, he may have blotted his copybook by letting out the fact that the National Party is secretly planning for a second election. National have been pushing a, putting out ads saying that National are going to put up the age of superannuation, but omitting the fact that that won't happen until 2044. Is that misleading? No, not at all. The National Party intends to raise the age of eligibility, eligibility for superannuation. And there is a significant proportion of the people who will vote in this election that will have to wait longer for their retirement and, uh, because of that. Are you spooking older voters, making them think that perhaps they might lose their pension earlier? No. What about, what about your ads that uh, National's going to cut the winter energy payment? Um, we have not been running those ads. The gist of National's arguments against you guys is that they would do a better uh, job of running the economy than you guys could be. What, what do you say? I say I deal in facts, and so let's deal in some facts. The New Zealand economy has grown more under Labour governments than it has under national governments. We've had more people in employment under Labour governments than under national governments. Um, and we've actually had a better track record of having the government books in surplus under Labour governments than under national governments. So if you deal with results, I know Christopher Luxon likes to talk about results. If you judge our results against theirs, they're actually much better. Hey, Winston Peters has told us today, he reckons Christopher Luxon is making a bit of mischief talking about the second election. It's not looking great, is it? I think it would be absolute pandemonium if Winston Peters, David Seymour, Christopher Luxon, Nicola Willis, Chris Bishop, and goodness knows who else is trying to sit around a table after the election and figure out how to form a government. I think New Zealanders can clearly see what an absolute train wreck that would be. Grant, just because um, you've got to go soon. Will, um, if you say on as finance minister, are you going to put New Zealand in an endless debt spiral? <laughs> no, and what I'm going to do is exactly what I've been doing for the last six years, which is strike a really careful balance. You know, we've faced some of the biggest challenges to New Zealand's economy in our history in the last six years, and we've come through that with an economy that's 8% larger than it was when we started, unemployment under 4%. For, for 24 months, our level of debt 
lower than most of the countries we compare ourselves to. None of it's been easy, and it's been especially hard for New Zealand households and businesses through this time. But what they've had is a government that has uh, been able to be on their side and get the results. And we don't need Nicola Willis to tell us that. We have independent ratings agencies who actually lifted our credit rating during COVID and have held it where it is now with a stable outlook. So I'd prefer to take their judgment on whether it's succeeding rather than hers. Will you take the job on I think I have to, and I think every single finance minister has to. So if they do blow out, if they do put us in an endless cycle of, what is it, spiral, <laughs> will you resign? It isn't going to happen, but I, I would be judged, as all finance ministers will be, on how we go. And that's the thing. When you actually look at where we were, say, in 2020, in terms of debt, we're actually well back from there. Because as a government, we were careful and we were balanced. And we do see our debt peaking up at about 22% of GDP and then coming down again over the forecast period to about 18%. When those ratings agencies come into New Zealand, that's what they look at. And they look at it and they say, yep, New Zealand's doing well. They recently, Fitch, downgraded the US because their debt was spiralling. That's spiralling debt, not what we've got here. Is that, I just want to be really clear, you will resign if dental costs blow out or any of your budgets blow out? I say every finance minister has to stand beside the figures that they put out, and I stand beside the figures I've okay, put so out. I stand beside the figures we've put out. I tell you what, Lloyd, if there's a cyclone, maybe not, but otherwise I stand by the numbers. They're still saying that um, their indexation policy of benefits is more fiscally sustainable. You know, the current projection is for unemployment to rise a little bit. Uh, are you, I mean, what's your take on that? Are you concerned about the indexation of benefits and what they do to the books? What I'm concerned about is people in households where the benefit is the main income being able to feed their families. That's what I'm concerned about. And we heard from the Children's Commissioner when we made the change to indexing it to wages that it was one of the best things we could do to reduce child poverty. We can afford this because we're a decent country that looks after people. I honestly think when you look at National's fiscal plan, the fact that it's propped up by cutting benefits, cutting climate action and bringing foreign buyers back into our housing market. If you just think about those three things, all of them are terrible. It doesn't add up. The fiscal plan is a sandcastle. National know that, hence why they're hitting out at us today. And they say it's not a cut. It's a, it's a reduction in the increase. You're well, what do you think? I mean, if they, in order for them to finance their fiscal plan, they have to find money. $2 billion is getting removed so that they can make their um, books balance. That's $2 billion that people in benefit-dependent households would have had. That is a cut. Does National, probably going to have to go. does National care more about landlords than beneficiaries? Quite clearly, the priorities that they've shown in their fiscal plan is that they want to give $6,000 a year to landlords, and by the end of the forecast period, they want $2,000 a year to be out of the house of those benefit-dependent households. I think that's a sign of their priorities. What do you make of um, <coughs> from National that, uh, that will, their policy will drive down... Um, or to stop the upward spiral of, of rents. Do you think that's a fair thing to say that landlords would do? I, I don't. I'll, I'll, I'll make a comment and then I'll probably just... Yeah, 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 back. Um, <coughs> but what I'd say there is that, you know, we had Treasury, um, the Reserve Bank and the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development do a pretty comprehensive study and it's the supply of housing that is the biggest mm -hmm. determinant in rents. I think what we're going to see with um, interest deductibility coming back on is simply that um, the rent that landlords will benefit from that, and renters won't benefit because National isn't planning to build any state houses after 2025 anyway. Sorry to. Can, can you just very quickly, in your own words, because it wasn't your own words before, explain how you got the six thousand dollars a year for landlords? Well, I just explained it there before. So basically we've taken the amount of money that's available for interest deductibility and put that against the number of landlords. But I'll actually get you the calculation so you can see it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Can you share the most challenging conversation with a constituent you've had on the trail today? Because one of the Nationals' allegations is that you only visit red seats and you surround them yourself with volunteers or the Labour Army and you don't have any hard conversations. Oh, that's just ridiculous. But no, I'm not going to. I'm not going to share every individual conversation that I have with people. People share their views with me. Um, th th you know, that's that's part of the campaign trail. Did, did you get any negative feedback or did people? Oh yeah, undoubt undoubted, undoubtedly, from time to time. Um, you will have seen actually. I was just pressed on diabetes medication in Waikanae just before. Was that your father? We saw. Downstairs. Yes, and, and I was very clear about the people who were greeting me, who were my mum and dad, who did come to say hello to me this morning this, today. Night. He says he's expecting you to be giving him a call on Saturday night. 
I look forward to speaking with him. Um, just on the Scott base refurbishment being put on ice, mm. um, no, it's no, no. <laughs> it seems Antarctic New Zealand didn't lock in a price with Lees when they announced him as a preferred contractor. This keeps happening. Um, why did you allow this to happen? Um, look, I haven't had a chance to look at that. Um, I understand it's an issue around contractor availability, but I haven't been, haven't had a detailed briefing on it. Okay. Chris, are, you, are you running the most negative and lie-driven campaign in recent history? No, and actually, if you look at the, the analysis, the impartial objective analysis of the National Party's campaign, which shows that 95% of their messaging has been negative, mm -hmm. versus the analysis of Labor's campaign that shows that 60% of our messaging has been positive, I think it's very clear who's been running the most negative campaign. Um, isn't you saying that National's cutting super equivalent to the National up to $250? Comment though. No, because it is a fact. They are proposing to increase the age of eligibility for superannuation. We've been very clear in all of our messaging that that's what they're proposing to do. Yeah, it's a pretty key context though, haven't you? Well, they can explain their own policy. Just this, um, this is one of your ads, free dental care for all under yes. 30s. There's no basic in there. It doesn't say basic. Well, we've been very clear what's covered well, and what isn't. That's not that clear though. That's very clear to New Zealanders that if they go to the dentist for their, their annual checkup, that will be free. That does not mean that every dental procedure and every surgery that they might need will be free. But do you, do you see that, that could, when people see that, they go, heck yeah, I can, it doesn't cost me $3,000 to go to the dentist anymore? Uh, for people going to the dentist for their basic care, it will be free. You don't think it's a little bit misleading? No. Uh, through October 14, like, whoever wins, you know, coalition, blah, 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 it's going to be super close and it could come down to the specials. Should New Zealanders prepare for, like, you know, three weeks of basically sitting around? Um, after every MMP election, there's always the possibility that there'll be a period where the result isn't clear, uh, because we could be waiting for special votes to be counted, for example. Yeah, there's also... Uh, could, could well be. There is also the potential for that, even once the, the results are clear, that it takes some time for parties to you know, have conversations about the formation of the next government. I've indicated that if we are in the position to form a government, we'll be aiming to do that expeditiously, um, and I'm confident that we would be able to do that. Um, if Winston Peters holds the balance of power, who knows how long it might take. But is there a realistic chance that it might wait until this day before the specials are back until you actually can start those negotiations? I think if it's clear that we are um, within stone's throw of being able to form, that we either, either can form a government or that we're within stone's throw of forming a government, we would start those conversations straight away. Um, I can tell you from past experience, the person who won't, uh, because he never does, will be Winston Peters. He will leave the country hanging um, until the final vote count is in, because that is what he's done in every other election. You've been working with both Māori Party and Greens in government. Presumably, as you've been talking to each other along the road, you've got a pretty good idea of what you would be able to do in terms of putting together a government. To what extent is any future government arrangement already pre-cooked? Oh, look, I, I don't think we would have a great degree of difficulty in finding plenty of common ground to form government. I'm sure there are going to be areas where we're going to have some, you know, you know, good conversations and very constructive conversations um, if we're in the position to be able to do that. But I'm confident we'd be able to pull together a, a very positive, forward-looking government for New Zealand. What do you think you can offer the, the Māori Party that would bring them on board? Well, look, I think I know from my conversations with them that the Māori Party, whilst they're out competing with us, we have a state of co-opetition with both the Greens and the Māori Party in the election campaign. I know that they are very supportive of a lot of the work that we have done in the Māori space. So I think, again, we've got a lot of common ground. At the beginning of the campaign, you said that you'd have more to say on Matthew Wellington moving later on in the campaign. Yeah. <clears throat> what is... Well, we did. In fact, we released the government policy statement on... Um, on land transport, yeah. which makes clear um, two initiatives from Let's Get Wellington Moving are being prioritised uh, by a, uh, by a Labour-led government, which is the uh, new Mount Victoria Tunnel and Mass Rapid Transit. Um, we've left open the option for what Mass Rapid Transit is, whether it's you know bus lanes or uh, light rail. We've left that open, but we've been clear that of the all of the Let's Get Welly Moving um, moving projects, those are the two that we are going to prioritise. Right, and, and the rest of Let's Get Welly Moving. <coughs> Structure, you have no plans to change that? Um, uh, we'll continue to work constructively with the local authorities in Wellington around Wellington transport projects, but the two that we are prioritising are the tunnel and mass rapid transit. It just seemed like earlier in the campaign that, that the governance structure might sort of disintegrate because there was no reason for it anymore. Well, by bringing the, those two projects under the auspices of the National Land Transport Fund, it by definition means that central government will be playing a more directive role in those projects. So do you anticipate that Wellington moving as like a governance thing? 
disappearing? Um, look, I'm, I'm open to continuing to work through some kind of partnership. Whether it's the current partnership or not, those are conversations that we can have, but I've been very clear on the two projects that we're prioritising. Any more to say on Auckland Light Rail before the election? Um, we've got a business case um, being developed at the moment. That will identify the preferred route. It will identify the preferred um, construction method, whether it's underground, overground, or a combination of both. Uh, it will identify where the stations might be. Uh, it will identify the cost. It will identify construction timeframes. Um, and it will identify financing options, how we would finance it over the life of the project. And just getting back to the coalition, possible coalition talks, mm. James Shaw has repeatedly said that the Greens want to have seats in the Cabinet. Are you open to that this time round with the Greens? That's all a matter of post-election negotiation, but I've said that all options are on the table, whether it's confidence and supply, whether it's coalition. Um, obviously, you know, different governing arrangements have different trade-offs for the parties. And I think that's actually the last conversation that you have when you're having these conversations. So I think the first conversation is what are our shared objectives? What are the policies that we want to pursue together? Figure all of that out first. Then you have a conversation about, OK, what's the best way of driving that forward? Is it a coalition? Is it a confidence and supply agreement or whatever? Um, I think that that conversation is the last of the conversations you have. Prime Minister, there's more than 500,000 uh, Kiwis in Australia. That's a lot of potential votes that could have a big sway here. What's Labor got on offer for them? Um, obviously, I'm very proud of the work that we have done alongside the Albanese Labor government in Australia to deliver um, much better support for New Zealanders who are living in Australia. Um, the, the fact that they now have a pathway to citizenship, which they previously didn't, is a sign of the work that we have been doing, our two Labor governments working together um, to deliver for Kiwis in Australia. Um, I'm really proud of our track record. We've, uh, Prime Minister Albanese and I set out some joint goals in terms of issues that we want to progress next, including making the Trans-Tasman border a much more seamless one. That's something that um, various governments on both sides of the Tasman have talked about for a long time. We believe that we can actually drive it forward and make it happen. Um, and uh, you know, I look forward to working with him in the next term to make that happen. There's talk of Jacinda Ardern uh, joining you in the next few days. Do we know when that's going to happen? She's not going to be here in New Zealand. Um, she's over in Boston, but I'm sure that she... Uh, having, I've, I've had a conversation with her. She'll certainly be... Oh, she's More to the point, she's contacted me to indicate that she is intending to be very supportive in the last few days of the campaign. Do you think this campaign has been fair on voters? Has it been easy for them to follow the policies and understand what each party is actually offering? I think all campaigns are a contest of ideas, and this one certainly has been. But when you, when do you, you think your ideas have been... Have the ideas been clear? Has it been clear what voters are actually deciding between? Well, look, I can put my hand on my heart and say that all of our policies are out there. They are properly costed. People can scrutinise the costings. And we certainly don't have economists from the left, right and the centre saying that our numbers don't add up. When you, when you say um, more supportive... <coughs> Just wait and see. You'll just have to. You'll just have to wait and see. Do you seriously think, um, with the whole Port Waikato quirks, do you seriously think that you could end up with another MP from it? So, what are the chances look, of Labor gaining an MP because of it? Just as likely as any of the other parties gaining an extra MP. So there is a formula that allocates out list seats. Because the Port Waikato seat will not be filled on election night, an additional list seat will be allocated. That will go to the party that would be next in the formula. That could be any one of the parties that's successfully represented in Parliament, depending on how the final votes fall. There's, a, there's effectively a table that you go through that allocates out the seats. So that one extra list seat, so the effect of the, of the Port Waikato seat not being filled means one more list seat any of the parties in Parliament could benefit from that. And it was and, quite a warm welcome you got there in Waikanae. Is that the warmest welcome you've had this campaign? I've had a lot of warm welcomes along the way. Um, and look, it was a friendly crowd, obviously. You know, there's a lot of Labour supporters there and quite a few members of the public as well who mm -hmm. had been out to vote and came up to express their support. Um, I've actually been getting very warmly received around the, around the country. I think about the walkthroughs that I've done in various shopping malls in Auckland in the last couple of days. Very similar response there. Um, very similar response in, in Christchurch when we did a, a walkthrough uh, there. Oh, I can't remember. Two and a half weeks ago now. If you lose track of time in these things. So, <laughs> and yeah. was, that, was that sort of the peak like, today? Or, you know, has, there, has there been a peak in the campaign for you so far? Um, no, we've, we've been really enjoying the campaign. We've been getting a very positive feel on the ground. Is, is it true that um, that countdown that you were at before in Waikanae, was that, that one of the few that you worked in? Yeah, so the first job that I had um, as a, a, I just finished secondary school was working for Quality Bakers. Um, I used to stack bread 
Um, that was the way that I financed my university studies. And the three supermarkets that I started with were Pack and Save uh, here in Coastlands, Woolworths, now Countdown here in Coastlands, and Woolworths, now Countdown um, in Baikonur. Was it a sort of full circle moment going back there? Yeah, I mean, didn't get to go into the <laughs> shop. But, um, yeah, I used to... Uh, I used to do the circuit of those three supermarkets on a daily basis right the way through the summer break. It's how I um, financed some of my university study. Um, Nicola Willis this morning uh, quoted Cameron Bagri, who last night said that the tax, their tax plans are possible, feasible, but she didn't include that he said, but not probable. What, <laughs> what do you make of that? I think Nic Nicola Willis is absolutely clutching at straws. Mm -hmm. I think you've got economists from right the way across the political spectrum, as well as the economic spectrum, um, who are saying that her numbers just don't add up. Okay. Yeah, okay. I'm going to have to go. Yep. Are you going to go and edit that to say basic? No, I think everybody's been very clear what it's mm -hmm. covered and what's not. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.
Great. Well, can I firstly just say thanks for uh, being with us today. Really appreciate it. Awesome to be here at Forest Wines and see a great New Zealand exporting company. Uh, as you've just heard, we have announced uh, an ambitious target to double the value of our exports within 10 years, including for agriculture and forestry and services and international education, technology and tourism, and of course viticulture, which is why we're here today. Uh, the government's role is to open up doors and to remove trade barriers, to cut red tape and to build relationships, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to be an externally oriented government that's out there hustling in the world, uh, pushing New Zealand's interests forward. As I've said, since I came into politics, I just think that Labour has been too inward looking, uh, too focused uh, internally and not enough uh, looking out in the world and looking for opportunities for New Zealand to do incredibly well. It's time for us to get some ambition, some aspiration, some positivity, some confidence and some mojo back in the show uh, and to get New Zealand out there in the world uh, doing everything it can to grow our trade in particular. So our target is ambitious, but that's what we should be striving for. We need to have more ambition in this country, not less. I do want to make another point today, which is that um, as we we saw with just three days to go, National is continuing to talk about common sense solutions and ideas to take our country forward, to grow our economy, uh, to solve the challenges that Kiwis have and to maximise the opportunities that are in front of this country. Uh, what we've seen and continue to see, I think, by contrast from Chris Hipkins is the way that he's carrying on the end of this campaign is the way that he started it, uh, with personal attacks and a tremendous amount of negativity. And that is quite simply because we see a government that has no track record to run on, no ideas to take the country forward with, and so it's easy to become about fear-mongering and scaremongering and actually making it negative and personal. I'm also very happy to say when I compare our fiscal plan to that of Labor's uh, that we are going to be very, very good and good for this country in managing our books and that we have strong economic management to give us the platform that we need to invest in our public services uh, and also in law and order. I've seen Grant Robertson's claims around our national fiscal plan and I just have to say I don't take lectures from Grant Robertson or Chris Hipkins on the economy. Uh, they are an economic la-la land and their track record of actually spending more, of taxing more and of borrowing more is bad news for New Zealand and we have seen that over the last six years and what we're seeing frankly is a fiscal plan from Labor that has some major holes in it uh, and we know that they cannot deliver. We see Grant Robertson has blown his operating allowances and his budget by $600 million each and every year. We see major flaws in the funding of the dental program which has been policy which has been presented as a free dental care pro uh, program for under 30s. It's dishonest, it's not true uh, and we've also seen it with respect to not making the right calculations around how they uh, cost their GST policy which frankly is a stupid policy because that money is not going to get through to a consumer as Grant Robertson well knows, as Michael Cullen leading the tax expert group well knew as well. So for us um, we look at it and we see a government that actually doesn't have the right financial plan to grow our economy so that we can actually build uh, this country as we need to going forward. Um, what we see is a government that frankly we think will continually serve and drive up more debt uh, forever, uh, we actually will miss its spending commitments the deficits and debt will be with us for longer uh, as a result of their poor financial planning. And then also they have big unfunded promises, up to $50 billion worth. Keep talking about light rail, but actually the $30 billion needed for that is not in this plan. Lake Onslow, $16 billion not included in that. Wellington light rail, not included. The income insurance scheme, not included. And so a lot of unfunded commitments financially. And as I said, uh, when you've actually spent all the money, it's about up 80%. When you've taxed New Zealanders an extra $100 million plus a day, uh, and you've increased government borrowing from $5 billion to over $100 billion, the only thing left to do is to continue to dream up wonderful new taxes, and that's exactly what we're going to see if Labor gets back in on Saturday night with the Party Māori and the Greens. Both those parties have as major bottom lines, increases in taxes and the creation of lots of new uh, innovative new taxes, and they need to tax more, and they'll tax Kiwis more because they, need, because they were addicted to spending and won't control their spending as a result. So my last message to Kiwis is that you know Saturday night is important. You know this election is really consequential. It really matters, and it boils down to who are, who you trust to manage this economy, so that you can actually work hard and get ahead. I think in the best country in the world, uh, and I just want everyone to think about it. If you wake up on Sunday morning and you find that to party Māori, the Greens and Labour are able to form a government, how is that going to feel? And so I just encourage all Kiwis to get out there now. We know New Zealanders want change. Vote for it, step up to the plate and, and let's get this done. Let's get our country back on track.
track and moving forward positively. With that, have you taken any questions? You Labor's have. saying you'll need to cut $3 billion more of spending in order to fund the plan. Are they right? No. Uh, we've had our plans independently verified by economists, as you well know. We've had other economists say they're quite plausible, quite possible. And as I said, our independent reviewers have said our assumptions are very prudent. And all importantly, what we've also done is we've built in buffer within our tax plan, but also within our broader fiscal plan as well. So um, we are incredibly confident with our plan. But so what, 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 I, what, I, what I can tell you doesn't stack up is a dental policy. And I've I got to say, this is pretty dishonest from Chris Hipkins. You know, he goes out there promoting that actually there's going to be free dental care for under 30s. And the reality was, and that's what's been used on the, that's the advertising, that's what he's been saying, free dental care for under 30s. And then today it's quite obvious it's not going to be free dental care. Under 30s are going to be paying thousands of dollars for their dental care. Uh, and as a result, you know, Chris Hipkins, frankly, you know, he's the Prime Minister, but he's actually the prime misinformer, uh, and he's continuing his campaign of misinformation. The, the, question, the question is about cuts, though, so you can guarantee right here and now that you won't cut a single dollar more than you've said in your, in your fiscal plan. Yeah, we've been really clear. Look, there's been so much increase in government spending and departmental budgets, as you well know, uh, that we're saying we want a 6.5% reduction in those departmental costs. Uh, we're going to task the CEOs to do that. How they deliver that? By stopping dumb and wasteful spending and projects that they have people assigned to, to make sure that they actually are aligned to the outcomes that we're asking them to deliver, uh, is completely achievable. And even completely if there's a achievable. From, from things like the foreign bias tax, you won't be making up for that with, with more, more cuts? Uh, we, we, we want to see our, our public service delivering for New Zealanders, and we are in a ridiculous yeah. situation. You're guaranteeing that you won't cut any Well, I'm, I'm guaranteeing to you that we're not going to have hire 13,000 more public servants, spend almost $2 billion on consultants and contractor fees, and deliver worse waiting lists at hospitals, worse academic outcomes for education for our kids, worse crime outcomes, and a, and a failing economy. That's not going to happen under us. You think so leaving the door open, though, that there is that one chance of the three point one billion dollars being cut out of public service every year. Is that true? Or no, no. It's, it's in our fiscal plan. We want a six and a half percent reduction out of departmental costs. That's our commitment. That's what we want to achieve. Uh, that's on average across all the core government departments. But what I'd again say to you is, you know, no disrespect. I'm not taking lectures from Hipkins and Robertson who have mismanaged our economy so badly and will go down a, as a terrible period for New Zealand over the last six years. Uh, and actually, when you have a dental program like they've promised, they, they've promised it's free dental care for under 30s. It's a completely dishonest. It's utterly dishonest. But 3.1 billion, that's off the table. That's not correct. Yes, absolutely, it's off the table. I mean, the, the, uh, it's Grant Robertson wanting to share misinformation again with his CTU mates, and we get all that, And but, but we're not about that. We, we, we understand the economy, we understand the e economics, we know how we're going to run it. We, we, national governments have done it before. We have to come in and clean up the ungodly mess that the Labour Party has left behind, uh, and we're going to do that. And we're going to stick to our fiscal plan, which we've outlined in great detail. Uh, we've had independently verified by economists, we've had other economists say it's completely plausible and possible, and we've had our independent people say, that we've been incredibly conservative and prudent and responsible as well. So I'm very comfortable with our numbers and our plan, but we are going to make sure that we actually generate a public service that delivers for New Zealand uh, and doesn't just spend and increase costs and not deliver outcomes and results. These accusations of... Well, what we're really focused on is the general election, and what I want the people of the Port Waikato to understand is they need to go out and vote and party vote, uh, because that is counted, and uh, we will deal with the by-election on the other side of this general election. But right now, the focus is on the general election and making sure the people of Port Waikato understand they still need to vote, and they need to vote party vote, and if they want change, they should party vote national. By-elections always have that possibility of the second election of coalition negotiations. Sorry? Why won't you rule out that possibility of a second election of coalition negotiations? Oh, look, uh, I, I spoke about this and my position's really clear. Um, you know, we have been very ob obviously saying we want to widen the National Party party vote as much as possible. Beyond that, we think a strong, stable coalition with ACT uh, is in the best interest of New Zealand. And I will certainly pick up the phone and talk to Mr Peters in New Zealand first if it means avoiding the party Māori, the Greens and Labour and that chaos and increasing taxes for the New Zealand people but and all, the, all that results from that uh, as a result. And I'll make that work. Thank you.
But then why bring up the idea of a second election at all? Why oh, it's just an right? acknowledgement that MMP elections are incredibly close and there's a range of uncertainties that are occurred in any MMP election or any MMP environment. But, you know, at the end of the day, what we have to understand is what New Zealanders need. And New Zealanders are saying they want change. You know, that the government is heading in the wrong direction. It has not delivered for New Zealanders over the last six years. And as a consequence, my ask is that you step up to the plate. If you want the change, you have to deliver the change. And that means party vote national. Even if you're an undecided voter, and maybe you've never voted for national before, but we know that we are getting lots of people who have never voted for us before who are actually wanting to step up and deliver that change. Are you by not ruling that out, though? We're just saying there's uncertainty in any MMP election, but what's important is we cannot tolerate you know, mortgage rates going through the roof. We cannot tolerate people not being able to f- afford food, rent, fuel. We cannot tolerate uh, crime being out of control. We cannot tolerate our kids failing in our education system or our healthcare system in crisis that's not there when people need it. And so that's what New Zealanders care about, and that's what I'm going to deliver for them on the other side of this election if I'm lucky enough to be elected. Do you think would tolerate a second election, though? This has already been... I don't. I don't think that will be a. It's a. What we're saying is, under MMP elections, there's uncertainty. But what New Zealanders cannot tolerate is another three years of a government that has chronically underdelivered for them, and as we're seeing today, hasn't even costed its policies properly. Won't be able to deliver them. You know, New Zealanders are sick of the non-delivery of a Labor government. It, how on earth do you have a three-year absolute majority and not deliver anything for Kiwis and have every outcome go backwards? It's a unique and special skill that this government has had to spend more to hire more, to borrow more, to tax more and deliver worse outcomes. Uh, it's a very special skill that Chris Hipkins and Grant Robertson have. Would you expect a heads up from Chris Hipkins about the date of the by-election, you know, consultation rather than sort of hearing about it through the grapevine this morning? Um, look, I, I spoke to the Prime Minister this morning um, about that, about some preliminary dates. I presume that he's announced the, the date uh, just recently um, before we started this press conference. And what about voter apathy? I mean, by-elections always have pretty bad turnouts. We've spoken to voters in Pukekohe already saying it's way too time. Uh, well, again, the focus needs to be on the general election. You know, I want the people of Port Waikato to understand that actually their vote matters, uh, that actually their party vote matters, because that's how we change governments. That's how we get a strong, stable government on the other side that will deliver for New Zealanders. And so I want them focused on that. We'll deal with the by-election afterwards. Will Andrew Bailey run it again, or is there a scenario where you say, hey, you're 16th on the list? take that list spot and we'll get a new candidate. Oh, I think Andrew Bailey's been an outstanding mm. local MP for mm. Port Waikato. I mean, he works incredibly hard for the, the people. He understands the area and the region well. He's built strong relationships and he's advocated for so many of those constituents. I think he'll be an outstanding local MP. Uh, just on FTAs, I mean, like, OK, you want to get one with India. For, for them, an FTA with dairy, they're not going to want it. For us, well, an FTA without dairy is pointless. How, what, what well, do I'll we tell have? you what's pointless, is that over six years, uh, tra- two-way trade with India has gone from two 2.8 billion down to 2.3 billion. It's the, it's the most populous country on earth this year. It's going to be our third largest economy in the world by 2030. And when you look at almost two-way trade with, with, with China at almost $40 billion, it's clear that we are chronically under-trading in India. And the problem is this. During the COVID period, the Australians managed to negotiate an early harvest free trade agreement. The Brits, the Canadians and the Europeans have done similarly. And we haven't even picked up the phone, managed those relationships because we've been so internally myopically focused over the last six years when actually we are a country of 5 million people that needs to hustle and we need to get out the world with some confidence and some ambition and some aspiration, be building those relationships, punching above our weight and doing what we've done best in our past. But the last six years, New Zealand has lost ground against the other countries in the world and our standing in the world has slipped. And so we need to rediscover that. And that's what Todd and I are talking about today is that we are going to be a forward-leaning, externally oriented country that gets out in the world and sells the best products and services to the world. And the government can help open up those doors and then businesses need to go in and actually step up and convert it. And that's well, what we're going to do. My question is about bargaining, though. Given that they're unlikely to accept an FTA with dairy involved in it, what power would we have? You know, is, would there be carve-outs? What, what, what do we have that they want? That well, want what I'd say to you is that we appreciate it's difficult, but we don't start from an assumption that we're going to make, you know, we're going to do everything we can to, to, to get as much value out of that relationship as we possibly can for New Zealand. You know, Australia has actually, when you look at the, you know, as we talked about today, Todd talked about, you know, the reality if you're an Australian exporter of wine and the tariffs that you pay in India now versus a New Zealand wine exporter, or I was talking to people who are, in, who are 
exporting apples to India. They've almost got double the tariffs uh, as a New Zealand operator versus if they actually put, you know, send their apples out from Australia. Uh, and so you know, that, those are things that we need to be doing everything we can to deepen the trading relationship with India. And there's lots of other things that we can be doing to build the flows of people-to-people connections, trade, capital, information that flows as a result of that. So again, it's a mindset issue. And this government has not had that hustling mindset. And as a result, we've been so myopic, so inward focused, so internally focused over the last six years that the rest of the world has left us behind. When Australia has actually rebuilt its international students to pre-COVID levels and we're still at half time. Yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, yeah. Nelson, so I'll come, I'll come to you. Nelson, one of the biggest issues for those guys is that Nelson Hospital rebuild. What's the National Party's policy on that? Well, we're going to increase our health budgets each and every year. As you know, we've built in uh, $8 billion worth of unallocated capital expenditure over the period of our fiscal plan. Uh, and we want to try and move the money from, we are not try, we will move the money from the centre and the bureaucracy out to the frontline services, whether that's hospitals, doctors, nurses, primary care. How much money and when would construction start? Um, well, what we've said is that we will look at that in government. We understand the need in Nelson. We understand the need all across the country. Uh, but when you go spend half a billion dollars restructuring DHBs into Health New Zealand and creating mega bureaucracies, that's money that could have frankly been spent on, on Nelson Hospital. When you go right off half a billion dollars worth of expired rapid antigen mm. tests because you're over order and the inventory expires, that's a, that, that funds a lot of hospitals. When we look at Dunedin Hospital, for example, one where the scope of that hospital has been pulled back dramatically, we have made a commitment to spend money there. Um, obviously Nelson and there's others that are on our list that we want to look at, but our idea is to increase spending each and every year to get the money out of the centre to the front line and also we have unallocated capital uh, that we can use as well through the period of our financial plan. Why is your candidate campaigning on this so hard though? Granted there isn't actually a policy in place you know, that Nelson voters can look to to say this is how much money you will get and this is when it will start. Well, it is on Shane Retty and my radar. Uh, it is something that we are well aware of and Blair's done a brilliant job of actually advocating for that. When we get to government, we need to look at a series of hospital investments. Uh, we understand that uh, and we, will, we, 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 we have it on our radar. It's in our consider- you know, it's right there, but we need to get into government and identify exactly that when we say we're going to do something, we do it in the National Party. We don't, turn, we don't say something then turn it on, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off. We don't say we're going to go build a Dunedin Hospital and it hasn't even started in six years. This is a government that hasn't started and completed a single major transport project, for example, in six years. So, you know, we don't do that. When we say we're going to do something, we do it and we follow through and we deliver it properly. And that's what we just want to do when we get to government, look at it all, see the capital needs, understand what else is needed, and then we'll make those commitments. Can you last question, please? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've ruled the party Māori out. Uh, we, we, rule, we have ruled them out, and no, we won't be. Regarding the, um, you know, the increasing conflict in Israel-Palestine, in the past, New Zealand has taken quite a strong stance against Israeli settlements and past you know, resolutions in the, in the UN you know, under um, John Key. Um, do, do, you see, do you see like a government you'd leave lead, um, continuing that? that well, what I'd say first of all is that or any change, you know, based on what's happened recently. Well, what I'd say is that all, all New Zealanders are shocked and saddened by what they've seen, and that those Hamas attacks on Israel, uh, causing massive uh, civilian uh, casualties to innocent civilians is just not right. And that's why we stand with Israel and it's right to defend itself, frankly. Uh, and, it's, and, and that's our position, that's sure. our long-standing position. The, que- the question's about, that, you know, New Zealand has taken quite a strong stance against what Israel's doing well, in Palestine. Well, our Palestine. long-standing... Would you be continuing that? Or, we, I mean, obviously, we, ACT has, has got a, you know, quite a strong policy around Israel as well. Like well, we, we, we support Israel's right to defend itself in the face of Hamas terrorist attacks, which we've just seen, that are yeah. causing huge pain and suffering to, to civilians. But you'd, it's look, unwarranted. You'd, look, you'd look to continue, essentially, New Zealand's foreign policy. We look to continue area? the policy, the long-standing policy, which is that we want to see a two-state solution emerge peacefully and, and diplomatically, and that's what we continue because to support. Compared to previous governments, you, you know, you're basically saying it'll be the same, or can you see a difference? Uh, as I said, we're committed to the long-standing position of so a no two-state change. solution no emerging and uh, making sure that that happens in a peaceful and diplomatic way. But I want to be crystal clear, the the attacks from Hamas on Israel um, are unjustified uh, and they are causing huge suffering for civilians, innocent civilians, and we stand with Israel and its right to defend itself. Over at the Council hearing today passed um, a business case for um, Wakatua Kotahi paying for a significant chunk of the 
horrendous costs of um, loss of access to the Marlborough Sounds. Is that, is that something that you would support, a very significant government contribution? Well, what we want to do is we want to work with local government in quite a different way. And you know what we have said to local governments and the local government conference and spoken to many of the mayors and all of the district councils who are well aware of our position, is that we want to do what we call city and regional deals. And essentially that is what has worked well in the UK, but predominantly in Australia as well, where actually central and local government come together, identify the critical infrastructure, and in this case it might be hospitals, it could be roading, it could be climate adaptation work. We agree what that set is, and then we agree the funding and financing between the two parties. We lock and load it so that whether the, the, the politicians lose their jobs, it, not everything gets turned off, turned on again, it actually carries on because that's clearly a 10-year programme of work. And so each, each of the... Sub each, each of the sub each of the sub regions of New Zealand are already many of them are already preparing their asks and are coming together with their neighbouring district councils to actually say this is what we need in the Hawke's Bay this is what we need in Southland this is what we need on the west coast and the same would be here as well so you know we we want to work with the mayors I think it has been a punch and duty show uh, between central and local government uh, at the end of the day we are delivering for New Zealanders and actually I want us united on delivering for New Zealanders and getting outcomes so what is the critical infrastructure Structure that has the most amount of difference, the most amount of people, in the fastest amount of time. Let's agree that. Let's agree how we're going to fund it between us, uh, and then lock it up for 10 years, and let's get to work. Because there's an awful lot of talk in New Zealand, but not a lot of action, and we need to get a lot more action. The rate and base like here, well, that's the more. point. That's the point. Is that actually we need to find funding mechanisms, and there is a lot of international, you know, internationally small advanced economies with many of the same challenges of New Zealand use international, you know, use different uh, funding and finance mechanisms to be able to do that. So our message is really simple. We'll have a 30-year pipeline of, of infrastructure projects through Infrastructure New Zealand, just like we see Infrastructure Australia do. We'll do 10-year city and regional deals that will be different by sub-regions of New Zealand. And importantly, the third piece is that we'll have a national infrastructure agency. Rather than regional provincial growth funds or tourism acceleration funds, we'll build that out of Crown uh, Infrastructure Partners and actually have an ability to actually uh, get funding and financing in place. And as you well know, we have such a big infrastructure deficit in New Zealand. We're also open to using private funding so that we can actually accelerate the, 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 the um, creation of roads and new housing and all of those good things that we desperately need to see. Thanks very much, Sorry, mate. Do you believe dinosaurs run to you? Sorry? Do you believe dinosaurs roam the earth? Absolutely. <laughs> what kind of question is that, mate? <laughs> okay, thanks very much, everyone. You didn't have still in there, did you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs>